Thank you, John. Well, thank you, Ian, for inviting me. You'll have to forgive me. I will read from notes most of the time because I can't remember everything, and what I'm talking about is very important stuff, and I want to be quite accurate, but not quite accurate, entirely accurate about it. Now, the title of the talk in the program is The Palestinian Holocaust, but I've titled it with a question mark at the end, and you'll see why later. It is a complex history of great sadness and lawlessness. I can only pick out a few salient things. My central concern is with Palestine, and I call it the hinge of humanity. But I will take in Iraq and Afghanistan, which are also part of Judeo-Christian imperialism. Judeo-Christian imperialism. They are all of a piece, a continuum. My outrage about what is going on in these places will be obvious to you, and I hope that all of you will share that outrage with me. My reason for standing here, a doctor and surgeon stands for healing and not for harming. I cannot stand seeing any creature harmed. And when I, see my when I sign my name, I prefix that, not with yours sincerely, but with for truth, reason, and justice, which are the three legs of my talk. At the end of my talk, I will give you some ideas as to how nations, entities, can murder, maim, and occupy in defiance of international laws and our presumed humanity, and how you might turn the foul tide and in question time, in fact, there's no question time, we'll leave that aside. We can discuss perhaps later on at four o'clock this afternoon how we might stop the Gadarene rush towards the abyss. Now, I wanted to find the terms because in any proper discussion, where's the water gone? Not to worry. I'll do that. Uh, Palestine is, what's Palestine? Well, it's a formerly very beautiful land between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea, and peopled for many thousands of years by a mixture of tribes, one of which was the, thank you, one of which uh, was the Philistines, from which the name Palestine derives, the Philistini, which I think they're still called in Arabic, I think. Holocaust, literally, it means totally consumed by fire, leaving just the smoke. It's a Greek word, but the kaust, interestingly, is derived from the Hebrew, meaning sacrifice. Its main modern meaning is the massive destruction of humans by other humans, massive destruction. For most people, it is associated entirely with the industrial and satanic killing of some billions of Jews under the Third Reich. Most people are less aware that Romanis, socialists, Poles, and other untermenschen were also gathered in. We must serve truth and include the near extermination of 20 million North American Indians by our lot and the Australian Aborigine by our lot as holocausts. Again, the Russians lost 27 million people in World War II People forget that or don't even know it. And without that loss, we would not be free in this country. There was a genocide of the Armenian Christians in 1915. If ever there were burnt and massive sacrifices, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were they. In a flash, and then the doors of hell closed with a boom. Zionism a religious and nationalistic ideo ideology, central to which is a promised land for a chosen people. Its followers tend to be exclusivist, racist, and supremacist. Historical context. That's the title, by the way. Can you see that? You can. I can't. Anyway, um, I've talked about, I've defined Holocaust, and down the bottom, there's another word called Shoah, 
Did anyone hear a show recently? Said. It's on the text, actually. But um, uh, Matan Vilnai, who is the Deputy Defense Minister in um, Israel, promised um, a greater show to the Gazan people if there should be more rockets. Now, he was pounced on for that, for good reason. Any Jew listening to that particularly would be very concerned to hear uh, an Israeli so-called minister promising a holocaust to the people in Gaza. In fact, it's been promised before, to be frank about it. But I think he meant calamity. It means calamity in Hebrew. And that calamity is very near the Arabic meaning of al-Nakma, which I'm going to talk about, which is catastrophe. Catastrophe and calamity. Now, these are maps which you never see on the BBC for a very good reason because they want to tell you everything in about uh, 30 seconds and uh, without any context, either historical or geographical. Um, the first map is 1946. The white bits are owned by the Jewish National Fund and would be worked on by Jewish owners. The next map in 1947 is a proposed partition of Palestine into 46% for 46 the Palestinian people, who represented two-thirds of the population, and the white parts are 54% for the Jewish people representing a third of the population. The next map is after the so-called War of Independence, the armistice lines, leaving Palestinians, as you see, in that green part in the so-called West Bank. And then the last map, which is even worse now, was in, is two, in 2000, it's labeled. But you can see that if you go north from the Dead Sea, up the Trickle, which is now the Jordan, or the Jordan, which is now the Trickle, you will see that there's no West Bank. That's in uh, Israeli control. You can see how the Palestinian populations are divided broken up by roadways, complex system, into what I would say were ghettos. And Gaza's that little bit, which is about 2% of the land surface, or less, for which Sue and I returned about seven weeks ago. The history. So you've got the geography. We'll leave that there. Um, Zionism started largely because of Eastern European pogroms against the Jews. And there was the ancient homeland of the Torah in the being of the Jew you know, where they came from. Zionism came to its promised land in the 1890s when the first Jewish European settlers started coming. At that time, there were only about 24,000 Jews who were integrated and mostly Aboriginal. They'd been there right from the word go, from, the time, from what, 2000 BC probably, their, 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 um, their ancestors. The Zionists did not want Arab laborers to go on working this promised land, and they lost their livelihoods by the, I never knew this until about a year ago, uh, by the 1920s there were squatter camps of Palestinians in Haifa. The Balfour Declaration, 2nd of November, 1917, am I speaking too loud? No? All right? Can you hear me all right? Good. Um, the, the British government was being badgered by the Zionists, headed by Chaim Weizmann and Lord Rothschild, the president of the World Zionist Association. Extraordinarily, these men were asked to provide a formula for a homeland in Palestine. It was very cozy because Balfour, the foreign secretary, was a Zionist. 126 words emerged on a half a sheet half a four sheet. Quite extraordinary when you see the facsimile. These were cabled to President Wilson for his approval. You, you will recall that Great Britain was greatly indebted to the US then. In fact, the debt from the First World War was only paid off about a year ago. Someone mentioned that yesterday. I think it was Tony Gosling. This is the, the declaration. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood 
this is the bit to do with the Palestinians, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. No Palestinian was consulted, in, and in later writing, Balfour showed his total disdain for them. The UK had given away a land that did not belong to it and to a people who had no conventional legal claim to it. Simultaneously, the Third Battle of Gaza was raging. I've written a piece on this, and if you went to my website, just Google David Halpin website, you'll find a piece um, in remembrance. No, I'll think of it later. But it's rather good, actually, because it brings the history into the... There's a big Commonwealth war grave in the north of Gaza, which I went to, spent some hours in photographing the graves. It's all meticulously looked after by the Palestinians there with funding from this country. There's 3,500 graves, just a small speck of what we got up to in the First World War. The Third Battle of Gaza was raging. This was one of the many battles being waged by the great powers, I put great in inverted commas on my text, to carve out their empires, the driving force for World War I. Not something I was taught about at school, I don't think. The British had enlisted Arab help in driving the Turks from Palestine after General Allenby and others promised them independence. Thus, there was treachery in Whitehall, and linked treachery 3,000 miles away. It needs to be said that the only Jew in the cabinet, Lord Montague, he just joined the cabinet, and Lord Sydenham, who I'd never heard until recently, both spoke strongly against the principle of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Lord Montague's statement is very worth reading. He was obviously a plain-speaking and truthful man. I think a very attractive man from the way he wrote. 1917 to 1946. I'm going to canter through this in about uh, 200 words. The process of colonization accelerated. In 1923, the League of Nations gave the mandate of Palestine to the UK. The Palestinian people, 80% Muslim, 20% Christian, saw the writing on the wall, and there was great resentment that was inflamed by preferential treatment of the Zionist Jews. There was underground violence and later a sustained revolt from about 1935 for three years, which was fed by joblessness and hunger on the Palestinian side. Three of a myriad of, exa three of, a myriad of examples of that oppression, of that partisanship, to put it mildly, the Zionists asked if they could establish a university, I think it's a Hebrew university in fact now, and the British agreed. The Palestinians asked, and the answer was no. Those civil and religious rights that I referred to in the Balfour Declaration were of naught. The Zionists set up their own forces, which the British co-opted since they were seen as allies, a typical British imperial trick, in fact an imperial trick. Lord Wingate, of Chindit fame, slant hat, trained and ran special night squads which carried out torture and summary execution of Arabs in the night, as is done now by the Israeli Defense Forces. The barbaric nature of the British occupation is captured thus in a letter home from one of our policemen, Sidney Burr. Any Johnny Arab who is caught by us in suspicious circumstances, is shot out of hand. And after a bombing, the police had descended on a souk and thrashed every Arab we saw, smashed all shops and cafes, and created havoc and bloodshed. For that, read Iraq. It's exactly what's happening in Iraq. In 1945, there was a concerted Zionist guerrilla campaign to drive the British out. The bombing of the King David Hotel in 46 
with the killing of 90 British and Palestinian persons is an example. And if I can, I'll say at the end. <coughs> 1947 onwards, <coughs> the mandate was given up by the British to the new United Nations. The thieves' kitchen of the League of Nations was succeeded by another thieves' kitchen <coughs> with a chief cook called the U.S. Partition giving, I already mentioned that, we'll skid over that. Palestinian Arabs and other Arab countries oppose this partition. And they upheld that the rule of Palestine should revert to its inhabitants in accordance with the provision of the Charter of the United Nations that had just been written. Had just been written. In other words, they were speaking for plurality, not for Jew or Muslim or Christian or whatever, as they have in Lebanon uh, on the Christian side, but they were speaking for really even-handedness. Ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians started in 1947. Civil war broke out, we can call it civil war, and initially there were Arab gains. The ethnic cleansing was accelerated, but the most brutal mass massacre of 250 men, women, and children. Are there children here, by the way? No. Um, at De Yassin, by the Ergun and Palmak brigades from the 9th to 11th of April, happened. I visited De Yassin and its few roofless buildings. There is nothing which commemorates the pain and the loss. One mile away is Vad Yashem and its memories of the Holocaust lit by the Third Reich. You know, there's a photograph of a pile of shoes. I haven't been there, but apparently it's a very moving place to be. Many thousands visit there, including heads of state. In fact, they always make sure the heads of state go there. But no one visits De Yassin. There were about 50 massacres of Palestinians in all. But it was De Yassin which caused tremendous panic because of its, because of its um, nature particular nature. The better off had fled already, but at least 750,000 took to the roads, to the east, south to Gaza, where we've been, and north to Lebanon, with those things they could carry. The keys to their houses were in their deep pockets, in the sure expectation, and this, is a, this I've heard so often, that their expulsion was temporary, they were going to go back. They were strafed and shelled to speed their evacuation by spitfires, the strafing. Some of the elderly died with the stress and from lack of water. Many ended up under canvas. Some wells were poisoned and cholera and other enteric disease was common. In some camps, it, it is said that only one in five children, one in five, reached the age of five. As the towns and villages were emptied, some houses were leveled and others later occupied by incoming Jews. About 500 villages were razed completely and towns and they became mounds planted with pines by the new Israelis. On the 14th of May, the Zionists declared their independence, 1948, from the British and the Haganah, or Haganah, not sure how you pronounce it, were fully mobilized and the War of Independence or the Arab-Israeli War, as it was called, had begun. Now, I'll show you some slides and of the people. This is on a website, um, Nakba. Can you see that? It seems very bright to me. Is it? Can you see it? Is it all right? Because they are, in fact, I've selected these out of about 50. By boat. Perhaps down to Gaza, maybe even to Egypt. There's a small refugee camp in Egypt, one or two. Oh. Probably going north to Lebanon by lorry. They were lucky. On foot, and I see quite a few of them are barefoot with their bedding. Interesting this, because you see no middle-aged people. And I then read 
that quite a few of the men, uh, males down to the age of 10, were put in internment camps in some parts. In the mud, in a cold winter, and the child nearest you looks as if it's more like a 50-year-old. All of them have consternation on their face, I noticed. Someone else has noticed this too. There's one picture of some smiling Palestinians you'll see shortly. A grandfather and a, again an older looking child. Nice accommodation. Hessian divisions. Children, I, some of these images I think are reminiscent actually of the um, camps of 1942. Behind those ladies, the lady in front in grief and um, anger, I imagine, behind is a building that has been demolished by shell or by um, dynamite. That, is, that looks medieval, doesn't it? It's come out of, my, of 1350, something like that. Being given some tinned meat from a dispensary. Ah, here's a hopeful one, obviously posed, looking towards the sunlight, and they're all smiling. It's rather a lovely family. At school, under canvas. Right. These terrible crimes were planned in the 1930s. Before any Holocaust. That's the point. Ben Gurion was the leader then, the father of Israel, I think he's called. And some of the quotations are chilling. He spoke, spoke of great force being required to remove the Palestinians from Palestine. In 1937, he said, the boundaries of Zionist aspirations are the concern of the Jewish people, and no external factor will be able to limit them. This is a speech that's uh, written in his memoirs. Menachem Begin, 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 another future prime minister, gloated over the impact this massacre on De Yassin had throughout Palestine. A legend of terror spread amongst Arabs who were seized with panic at the mention of our Aragon soldiers. It was worth half a dozen battalions to the forces of Israel. Arabs throughout the country were seized with limitless panic and started to flee for their lives. This mass flight soon developed into a maddened, uncontrollable stampede. Over 600,000 Palestinians fled the slaughtering Jews. The political and economic significance of this development can hardly be overestimated. This happened 60 years ago, a few weeks ago. As I was just thinking about this outside my talk, I thought um, it's a Sunday morning, and Matins is just about to finish, I suppose. And I thought, how many Matins, in how many sermons is this being discussed in our country? And the answer is nowhere, nowhere. Although there were some quieter times, the suffering of al Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, has continued without let up. Over 100,000 homes were demolished at the start. Since 1967, well, of course, gone. 18,000 homes, what I call the temples of the family, have been blown up or crushed with machines. As we sit here now, there'll be a house in the so-called West Bank being demolished. Even though the starting population was only a million in 1948, of Palestinians, over 600,000 Palestinians have been through Israeli prisons. This includes minors. Over 11,000 are in prison now, a thousand of them without charge. So-called administrative detention, which is a, a, a British uh, mandate law they use. And it includes 30 legislators, Hamas people who were elected 
by their people in scrupulous elections. Torture has not ceased. Since the start of this, the Second Intifada in September 2000, over 4,000 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis have been killed. The ratio of children killed is nine to one Palestinian to Israeli. Children get shot for um, throwing stones. I mean shot, sometimes shot to death at armored, ve at armored vehicles. And um, about 35,000 Palestinians have been injured in this second intifada, some of them very, very seriously, and I've seen some of them. The actions of the Israeli occupation force and those who direct it are beyond international law and humanity. For instance, the siege of Gaza, which I saw at its start in March 2006, and which was accompanied by shelling, is collective punishment and of a population due special protection from its occupation. I mean the siege, the blockade is collective punishment. Of course it is. The litany is long and very painful even to read. For instance, on the 16th of this month, what's that, 10 days ago, 10 Merkava tanks surrounded the Al-Wafa Rehabilitation Hospital in Gaza as they fought with freedom fighters defending the eastern border. I have a very close relationship association with this hospital. Cannon and four shells were fired at the hospital. Water flooded from the roof tank, they always shoot that up, uh, and the electricity was cut. The patients were terrified, but happily no one was injured. I could tell you of thousands, thousands of lawless and pitiless acts. They come in every day on the internet, and I hear of them over the telephone from my Palestinian colleagues. The lawlessness is well recorded internationally. The General Assembly Resolution of 194, 194 was passed in 1948, six months after the Nakba started. This directed that those refugees that wished to live in peace should return to their homes. I have said how so many were destroyed. For those who wanted to stay in their camps, compensation was to be paid. The new Israel ignored Resolution 194 just as, as it has ignored the several hundred uh, General Assembly and Security Council resolutions since, with the connivance of the US and often the UK. I've covered a fraction of the evil. The wall, for instance, I have jumped over. The settlements in the West Bank and the 450,000 Israelis within them, the facts on the ground, as Sharon called them, which expand as I speak. Return. The Jewish diaspora. The scattering, the diaspora means, goes back to the Roman occupation of Palestine and well beyond. Anyone who is a Jewish mother has the right of return from anywhere in the world. The Palestinian diaspora uh, sp sprung from El Nakba in 1948 and since. No Palestinian is allowed by the Zionist entity to return to the land which is called Israel. There are even difficulties in his visiting the remnants of Palestine. By a variety of means, which include suicide bombing, but mostly through a gracefully partisan Western press, the Palestinian has been turned from victim into culprit and blame hung about him. Holocaust. I return to the title. I have not described the, history of the Palestinian Holocaust. I have instead described an ethnic cleansing, as Ilan Pape has entitled in his book. Ilan Pape now lives in this country. It was massive at first and continued. This is an element of genocide as described by the Polish Jew Lemkin. Cleansing, an ugly word, and genocide no less but realize the Western nations have been complicit in their silence or by their activity, as in the case of the US. Just as now, over 40 Western nations, including all 25 EU countries, are aiding and abetting Israel in its strangulation of 1.5 million people, half of them children in Gaza. It is a pogrom, it's a pogrom of a size which has never been seen before, I don't think.
Very briefly, I'm going to speak of the war crimes committed 500 miles to the east in Iraq. In 1991, and in the tail end of Desert Storm, we, the British, bombed the General Hospital and the Children's Hospital in Basra. Who knew that? We bombed two hospitals and the rest. War crime. Sanctions were started to force Saddam to disarm. War crime. Forget the UN bit, the, the, the frills. The, U the US and UK enforced those sanctions alone after the French pulled out. Hardly a mouse entered Iraq. Penicillin was barred in case it could be used for germ warfare production. What nonsense. The previously excellent medical and water services deteriorated, and food was short. In the 12 years of sanctions, over 500,000 children died who otherwise would have lived. How's that for Holocaust? Reporter, we have heard that half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children that died in Hiroshima. And, you know, is the price worth it? Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State for the United States of America, replied, I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Relatives of hers died in the concentration camps. And then the planned war, with all its pretexts on a country which was, to, which was no threat to the US, UK, or any other country, and which had no lawful basis under the UN Charter. That has killed over one million Iraqis, maimed by rule of thumb at least two million more, caused four million refugees, half internal and half external, so-called IDPs in the UN bureaucracy, and widowed a million women. The barbarity and lawlessness is beyond all words, and for those relying on our formal media with their embeds, it is beyond all truth as well. And as we sit here now, there'll be women and children being taken into broken up, dirty hospitals in Baghdad who've been bombed or had missile strikes in the Sada city as we sit here. Just before I finish, I will show you images of Ali Abbas. This was about 10 days after the start of Mr. Bush's shock and awe, which was, which was the first part of his, of his ironically titled Operation Enduring Freedom. Ali's family were asleep when a weapon exploded. His mum and dad and 14 relatives were incinerated. That's why I asked for any children here. I, there's a, there's a, a um, journalist, presenter, um, I sent her this image, I think. And I said, you must be showing you these images. She said, oh, we can't show that. We can't show that. I said, you must show that. People are bought into this. They're watching football matches, doing all sorts of mundane things. They're paying taxes. They're putting votes on uh, slips of paper for one clown after another, Brown or uh, Cleggett, or he calls himself Cleggett, and um, they must know what's going on. This fellow, Ali Abbas, I think is a very important photograph, and I haven't got to the bottom of it. But the thing is that if you examine it, his head and neck and his upper arms, his shoulders, are unblemished, and you'll see, you won't see it actually, it's the other photo shows him with a catheter in, but his legs are fine he has a burn about an inch deep over his trunk on the front of it, and his forearms have been incinerated. You can see the forearm bone sticking out of them. Now that boy was subjected, and, the pe and his relatives were incinerated, to the most tremendous energy. It is not the flash of a thermobaric weapon. You get flash burns. I could show you lots of those from Gaza, where they're being used, as they are in Saudi City and elsewhere in Iraq. But, um, and it's not a uranium weapon, 
which they also use, and they use a lot in Iraq, and now they're evil. It is unbelievable what's going on. This, I think, is probably a neutron bomb or some other thermonuclear weapon, something with a tremendous uh, heat output, because this infrared is in a flash of Dunister's poor arms. So this boy was liberated of his arms. Do you remember liberation? They were talking about strewing flowers in the street when we invaded the place. He survived and attended a private school in London. The headmaster offered him a place there. But there is a typically cruel twist, which I think uh, symbolizes our country. He has an uncle to attend to his toilet, of course, with no arms, and for his dressing, etc. He went back, I think, the summer to Iraq, last summer to Iraq, and a different uncle was then engaged to help him. Since last September, the UK, UK Immigration Department will not renew visas for Ali or La visa for his uncle. I'm pointing to the obvious fact that the powerful own the law. Israel, the US, and the UK act with impunity. They must not. We must reclaim reason and banish evil force. How we do that, I wish to be the central matter for discussion now. We're not going to have questions. My, the Suprema says that we must leave that. How many more minutes do I have in? Five minutes? Oh, that's very good. That's, well, that's lovely, because that, it will fix very nicely. Um, just, I, just, I must get that picture off. And uh, this is Ali. And I think, I've shown this picture, in fact, to my fellow colleagues, my doctors, co the surgeon colleagues. And um, I don't think they like, they don't like talking about these things. They don't like talking about political things. Not political. We're talking about right down the bottom. We're talking about the root of things. But they have seen it, actually. And I think I've shown it three times before. And I said that this boy is looking at us. He's saying, I think, what have you done to me? And I hope he's saying, or I hope we're thinking he's saying, are you going to go on doing this to other people? What we must do. So you see what I've done. I've set what I think is the most evil treatment of a largely pastoral people who I got to love a lot, Palestinian people, by people who've also been abused a lot, but they've abused the people they've now supplanted terribly. But I set it in the context, and you just think of Afghanistan and Iraq, and you think of, you think of um, Palestine. The hour is late, very late. The rogue republic and two rogue states are winding up to attack Iran with tactical nuclear weapons. What do we do? What should be our reaction? What should we, what should we be thinking? First, silence or nihilism is complicity. The German people are still reviled for their silence. The piece that I've written on my website, looking from the side, I think it is, the German people are still reviled for their silence, but exactly the same techniques were used on them as are being used on you now. The burning of the Reichstag in 1933, which I only knew about five years ago, because I was so fully educated, uh, that put fear in the hearts of the Germans, and became frightened of each other, and ushered in ever more draconian laws the 9-11 and 7-7, and I mean that, of this project of the new American century is doing the same here. We are now at 1939. Do not be silent in the twilight. Your children will not say thank you for saying repeatedly, I feel powerless, which you hear so many people do. Inform yourselves. The internet, which whilst it is, remains largely free, is a bastion of freedom. Public meetings like this must regain their old importance. Measure the untruths in the media, especially in the state broadcasting service, what myself and others call the Zionist broadcasting service. 
for very good reason. Deluge it with complaints about its almost perpetual bias, including the tide of anti-Islamic and other racist dross designed to distract you and to polarize you. Adams said in 1775, liberty cannot be preserved without general knowledge among the people. Very true. Then stand up and speak out when you feel you must in every possible place, to neighbors, family, public places, newspaper columns, the media. Put notices on, board, on boards on your car, if you have one on all bridges, if you um, don't have a car, and reckon that the 2,000 pound fine for um, um, litter or fixing bills is something that you might have to pay. Demonstrate with others so that you can feel some solidarity, but I get to feel this is a, has its limits. Direct nonviolent action. The crimes being committed by Bush, Brown, and Olmert and others are so great that it is fully justified in morality and law, i.e., this is the key, the prevention of a greater crime. Those people, like Linda Persis, who disabled a B-52 at Fairford, were right to do that. Right to do that. I'm not sure, as a very law-abiding man, that I would have the guts to do it. <laughs> but I'm thinking about it. We're, um, we're to, we are to lead intentionally. Political, you know, the Chartists and people were way ahead, the Tolpuddle Martyrs. We read that what they wrote, we've gone backwards in terms of thinking independently. The grotesque injustice we see this is the political sphere. The weeping we hear means that our political system must never be the same again. Shut your ears to liberals who think that negotiation correspondence with an MP who voted for the massive assault on Iraq will bear fruit. They delude themselves and others. They are the handmaidens of the totalitarian. You know that what I say applies to a large majority of MPs who are worthless, worthless. If you got shot at 95% and left 5% in there, you'd find that things would go on rather better, perhaps. The incumbent here in Totnes is a point, a case in point. At the talk by Martin Bell in May two years ago at the um, Great Hall, Mr. Steen was challenged about his support for the Iraq War. I hope I'm correct in saying that Mr. Steen said the Tories voted for the war because Labour voted with them on the Falklands. You scratch my back and I will let you do a Churchill on Iraq. That's an illusion which I need to explain later. Churchill got some um, mustard bombs dropped on Iraq in 1925. <clears throat> what Mr. Steen did not say was that Duncan Smith Ankrum and Jenkin had crossed the pond at least twice to get their marching orders for Iraq from their Republican neocon, zeocon pals in 2002. They have been in complicit in crimes of the greatest magnitude. In a just world, they would be in those jails they are so eager to build. Blair spoke in 2006 of an arc of extremism as the bombs were falling on Lebanon and the people were dying in Gaza and in the West Bank and by the score in Iraq, the latter of his making. He spoke of extremism. There is not an arc, but there is an axis of extreme evil. At one pole there is Tel Aviv, at the other is Washington, and sitting in the middle to give it formality and pomp and flummery is London. Power oscillates backwards and forwards along this axis as busily as all those jets carrying the individuals. The axis has no interest in justice or in true, in true democracy. It cannot warm to the smile of a child or comfort a tear. Our democracy is an illusion. It has failed and it has caused the greatest suffering. We must not excuse it, but renew it. There must be some peaceful revolution. 
I don't know how. You must go to Palestine if you believe that what I'm saying matters, as I believe it does. If you go there, you can stand with your brothers and sisters, embrace them, see their resilience, and be warmed by their smiles 50, 60 years after agony started. Challenge the Israeli state by just being there. They don't like you being there. Um, learn a great deal more and absorb the undiluted evil of an occupation there. Being there gives them heart and they value it greatly. Even more, and above all everything else, we must be outraged. We must, be out we must not talk about these things in banal ways. We must be outraged by what is going on, what we see in our world. And just about another minute. If there is, this is what, there's a lady who is a director. She's one of the few Christians in um, Gaza. Spinster, she's the administrator at the uh, Ali Arab Hospital, which was started actually by, I think, Baptist originally. It was a, it was a wonderful place. People came actually even from Egypt uh, for diagnosis, and uh, it had a very high reputation. But in the latter part is her words, but I pre preface them, or put these words in before. If there is no tr truth, there will be no justice. If there is no justice, there will be no peace in Palestine. If there is no peace in Palestine, there will be no peace in the Middle East. If there is no peace in the Middle East, there will be no peace in the world. That was Suhail's words, the last two lines. She's right. But the justice, the truth and the justice come first. I'll finish by reading a poem. I don't think... I'll leave that actually on there just for a moment. That'll be my final words. Uh, my sister found the other day on a website, lovely website, a man called Mike Odatala. He's another refugee. He lives in America now. Palestinians are all over the world, Chile, all sorts of places. And what distinguishes, well, a certain feature of the Arab is their, their love of conversation. They enjoy spending time, having a cup of mint tea, and they love using this very lovely language, Arabic. And they're also good poets, because I think that comes, of course, with a more verbal tradition. They're not very good at writing letters, to be blunt about it. But um, they don't be driven a bit for that. But this, is a, um, this is a poem about spring in Palestine. And on his website is a picture of an um, almond blossom tree, which I forgot, which I didn't include on the little run of slides. But what it does is it expresses their resilience and their art and their long vision. They can see that things will be better one day, thank God. Um, thinking of spring in Palestine. What benefit or joy if I were to gain the world but lose the almond blossoms in my land? Drink a cup of coffee every place but my mother's home. Journey to the moon, but not to the graves of my ancestors. See the world wanders, but not the setting sun as it dips behind the ancient olive groves. Tour the world over, but lose the flowers on the hills of my native land, and they are lovely, what's left of them. Nothing but lethal silence. No need to gain the world, just a cup of coffee, in this familiar place, and an end to the lethal silence within the hearts of the living. And those are the motifs for the talk today. And what I'm doing. Schweitzer um, was a MD times four. Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Music, and Doctor of Theology. He was a devout Christian. 
And he ran a sort of fairly basic place in the Congo, which I read about when I was 12, which gave me the spark to go into medicine, or at least to think about medicine. But his sort of catch phrase, you could call it, was reverence for all life. I feel that very strongly indeed. And the next thing, the next line I, I use when we were to, when we um, and I chartered the boat five years ago, and it's an adaptation of what I used to say on the wards in the theatre. We must do our best to heal and not to harm. Tell that to Mr. Blair, whose hands have blooded the altar rail of Westminster Cathedral. Or to Mr. Bush, who received the pontiff with his nice little hat with a little wiggle on the top, and um, spoke of the sanctity of life, or some similar phrase. Bush, talking about it two weeks ago enough to make you sick, isn't it? Um, but would he know what I meant by do your best to heal and not to harm? Not. He wouldn't have an idea about it. And I will finish by saying this. Some of you have heard me say this before, and I'm not going to apologize for that, that I have, there will also to be on the slides as well, the three lovely grandchildren who were joined by a third three months ago. Delilah, the very um, Hebrew name. And I say that I look, in, I look at their lustrous skin and their lovely hair and their happy blue eyes. I look into their eyes and I see two billion of the world's children. Every child is precious and not one, not one should be harmed. Tell that to Bush or Mr. Clegg, or Mr. Mr. Um, Brown, Mr. Brune, or that other clown, what's his name, the conservative fellow, Cameron. They don't even talk about it. They're silent in the house. Thank you very much. Thank you.